Greetings and welcome from the Muslim Voices podcast at Indiana University Center for the Study of Global Change. My name is Arsalan Iftikhar, founder of themuslimguy.com, and I will be your host for today's episode. On today's first episode of the Muslim Voices podcast, we will be speaking about the plight of the Chinese Uyghur Muslims with prominent lawyer and activist Nuri Turkel. Nuri Turkel is a U.S. educated Uyghur American lawyer and human rights activist who was born in a re-education camp at the height of China's tumultuous cultural revolution. He came to the United States in 1995 as a student and was granted asylum in 1998. In May 2020, Speaker of the House of Representatives Nancy Pelosi appointed Nuri as a commissioner to the US DIRF, the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And in September 2020, Nuri was named one of the Time 100, sorry, in September 2020, Nuri was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. Nuri, I want to thank you for joining the Muslim Voices podcast today. Thank you very much for having me on. A pleasure to be working with you on this project. So, Nuri, uh, so first of all, can you just tell us a little bit uh, again about the historical background of Uyghur Muslims? Uh, you know, a lot of Americans and a lot of people here in the West uh, might not understand the sort of anthropological historical background of the Uyghur Muslims, where they come from. And so, again, any background information that you can provide in terms of the Uyghur people, uh, again, ethnically, religiously, culturally, uh, would be helpful for our audience members here today. The Uyghur people are Turkic Muslims. Uh, they practice uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, before converting to Islam, Uyghurs practiced uh, shamanism uh, and other uh, religious practices um, that were uh, that are uh, still in practice in the Eurasian continent. Um, the Uyghur people have had uh, a sovereign, uh, independent state in the past. The first time was in 1933. Uh, and then the second one was in 1944. With the help of uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, uh, Mao's China invaded, uh, into, uh, invaded the Uyghur region, uh, known as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, uh, formally uh, that the Uyghur people call East Turkestan. Uh, so the reason that East Turkestan name is so uh, revered, desired, is because both uh, 1933 and 1944 Uyghur Republic uh, was named uh, East Turkestan Republic. So it, 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 uh, sometimes uh, people call that Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang means uh, new territory, new dominion. Uh, it, it has a, a colonial connotation and people resent that name. Uh, even in, in instances where uh, people are so sympathetic and said, oh, you're from Xinjiang. I'm like, no, let me stop you. It's, I'm from East Turkestan and Uyghur. It's that sensitive. Uh, so, um, so the, yes, Uyghurs have had um, a very long political history, um, and Uyghurs are very good at um, uh, the Uyghurs are known to the Chinese within China as a group of people who look different, uh, whose homeland produces uh, one of the best fruits, vegetables, uh, rich in natural resources. Uh, they are far away. Uh, they look different. They act different. They speak different. Like sense of others have been a part of the social response, social uh, uh, attitude towards the Uyghurs, as well as the reason for the Chinese government to uh, formulate now correctly labeled as a genocidal policies. I explain, now here's the, the reason. Um, when you look at, when you listen to the Chinese government's narrative and some sympathetic individual's explanation, it oftentimes suggests that China is uh, in this position that had to take these draconian measures, uh, this engage, supposed to engage or should engage in this kind of brutal repressive uh, practices to achieve the national security. And the, the very foundation of that concern um, based on uh, the Chinese narrative, based on some scholars narrative that uh, the Uyghurs ethno-national identity, the religious practices, uh, pose long-term political threat. And it could be a reason for uh, unrest, destabilization, that could pose threat to the existence of the Chinese uh, state, uh, particularly the ideology, the very ideology that is polar opposite uh, to Islamic faith, promoted, uh, expanded, imposed today by the Communist Party. Uh, they tried to replace Islam. 
They tried to replace other uh, Western religion, particularly Christianity, uh, thinking that these two religions in particular, when you look at their policies, they're just going after these two particular group. Uh, even in the situation of Hong Kong, the Jimmy Lai, for example, a very devout Catholic. Um, that, is the, that is the foundation of how uh, China has been treating Uyghurs with a different name throughout history, splitist, uh, uh, extremist, and now since 9-11, Uyghurs become a convenient uh, target uh, with a label that people will not generally, uh, uh, in the face of growing Islamophobia around the world, that Uyghurs also uh, pose uh, terrorism uh, uh, threat to the national security. The Chinese government claimed that uh, claims that the Uyghur population is around 12%. I'm at 12 million. Uh, most Uyghur intellectuals, uh, the Uyghur diaspora, dispute that number. Uh, the Chinese government uh, has a habit of either uh, over-reporting or under-reporting something so obvious. The, the idea that the most Uyghur intellectuals have on the population uh, figure is that they try to make the world to believe that it's a tiny minuscule population in comparison to 1.4 therefore they're not going to be you know important so it's a kind of uh, you know strategically planned and orchestrated way of uh, making the population small There's just the effort to make them even more small irrelevant in in the in the uh, chinese uh, uh, chinese prefer and also, um, one other thing need to be mentioned, when you uh, look at the map, you can have idea uh, why certain conflict and certain policies, uh, certain ways of the government's bad, bad actors behave. Uh, the Uyghur's homeland, East Turkestan, makes one sixth of China proper. It is the size of Alaska, uh, four times the size of Cal California, the size of Western Europe. It's huge. Um, and it has a long international border. Long international border means uh, uh, national security concern for the state, as well as the opportunity for uh, economic expansionism. And now since 9-11 that the United States is in, in Central Asia, previously it was a kind of a ba backyard for the Russians and the, uh, the, the Chinese. Now there's a geopolitical um, uh, Strong, uh, uh, competition in that region, if you will. And, and then um, uh, the China's global ambition also goes through that part of the world uh, without properly, completely controlling not only the property, the precious property, also the soul of the people will get them not only the sense of uh, security, but also access to Eurasian market so that their Belt and Road Initiative, the, the global ambition will be realized. When you look at their policies with countries like India, uh, with Pakistan, uh, Iran, uh, and Central Asian stance, uh, it, it, you can easily uh, sense that uh, much of the stuff that the Chinese does, uh, the Chinese government does to the Uyghurs, uh, have very strong uh, uh, geopolitical aspect. Absolutely. And, and before we sort of dive into that, Nuri, uh, I'm actually more curious about your own uh, origin story. Uh, so if you could tell our viewers a little bit about your own personal background, obviously, you know, growing up there, but obviously then coming to the United States, going to law school, becoming a lawyer. So tell us a little bit about your own background and, and how you got to where you are today. Thank you for asking that question. I, I was, um, as you mentioned, I was born uh, in a Chinese re-education camp. Uh, which is very similar to the one that they initially set up. Yeah. My mother was uh, four months pregnant uh, with me when we were taken in. So I spent, um, um, and then mother, my mother gave me a birth in a very uh, uh, torturous environment that she was injured because of repeated physical abuses. She gave a birth while she was wearing a cast chest down. So um, you can imagine how, um, I've been to the delivery room. Uh, I'm a father of two beautiful uh, children, so I know how it how difficult that is. Let alone sure. being in the cast. So, uh, so she gave birth to me in such a horrific uh, situation. So, about three days after I was born, my mother and I were taken in again in the camp, and uh, uh, and I, my health was deteriorating. So I kind of 
I was the kind of reason for the authorities to let my mother go. So I, I didn't even look good uh, at some uh, in, in after the after the release from the camp. Uh, my parents even um, didn't want to show my face to the people uh, who are cu curious about their first child, thinking that if any negative comment is made the way that I looked, uh, big head, tiny neck, uh, fragile body, they will be uh, they will be saddened. So they even didn't want to show my face to the to the um, the neighbors and friends and family. So I survived. Uh, but what is most disturbing to me uh, over the years is that I came to the United States 20, about 26 years ago, uh, initially as a student. Uh, I was not planning to go back. Those people who are not really in the, in the situation to understand applying for asylum is a very difficult personally, not you know, forget it, but some people just have uh, anti-immigrant mentality, but it's not that easy to make that decision. It took me literally three years to get that point to say, okay, I need to save my life. The turning point was that in uh, February 20, uh, 20 uh, February 5th, 1997, in my father's ancestral uh, hometown, there was a, uh, a, a protest, street protest uh, against nuclear testing. Uh, against banning of this Meshrep group, which is a uh, kind of uh, a boys and girls club that teach uh, Islam, uh, moral values, you know, uh, educating people that the drugs and the alcohol and premarital sex, that kind of stuff is no go. And the government did not like the growing. And then the, uh, the kids took to the street. So there was, it was a peaceful protest that had, that was a turning point for me in my uh, life in the United States that I cannot go back to that country. So they, even the frigid weather, uh, they use water cannon uh, and, and they use a, 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 a armed police to, um, to uh, react to the uh, uh, peaceful uh, protesters who are as young as 15 year old. Wow. And uh, this was February, February 5, uh, two, uh, 1997. And it happened in around the neighborhood that I spent a lot of time as a child uh, in my father's hometown. So uh, that prompted me to apply for asylum. Wow, so, and, and, and as a follow-up to that, um, you know, for, for you know, uh, you know, for a lot of people, uh, especially the Chinese government, always likes to mention that um, you know the current uh, crisis uh, began with the July tw two thousand nine uh, social unrest in Urumqi uh, in, in the capital. Uh, they use that as obviously the pretext for a lot of, the, as you mentioned, the the, the counterterrorism. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, initiatives. And so can you tell us a little bit about that social unrest and, and why yeah. so, what is the significance of that? Yes. Uh, so the, the, the week has always been, you know, this, this need to be uh, 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 clearly explained. The week has never stopped longing for political freedom, uh, social justice. You know, this is the Uyghurs are by nature, very political people. Um, uh, nothing wrong with it. Um, it. You know, the Uyghurs are one of the few people in the Turkic family ever had a country and empire, if you will. Okay. Even if you go to Turkey, they study Uyghur history as part of the beginning of Turkish history. Oh. Uh, Pre-Ottoman pre, uh, pre history is basically the Uyghur history in Turkey. So, okay. it, so the, the desire to have uh, a country uh, or manage their own political affairs never disappeared. So in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Uyghurs were very inspired that, you know, on the other side of the border, uh, who the people literally did not raise a finger and now have a country. Maybe it's not yeah. us now. And then in 97, that incident happened. And then fast forward 2001, 9-11 uh, happened. So they ratcheted up uh, the pressure. Uh, just this forced disappearance become very common practice. Anyone who opposes uh, become a terrorist to the Chinese government, uh, and they become very aggressive in the international uh, 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 community uh, using their diplomatic and economic power, uh, more so than what is happening today. And during that time, I think this is very relevant to what we're talking about. I am I am like immersed in this for stop the forced labor campaign. So July five was a result of forced labor. I see. Uh, Americans buying cheap uh, goods made in China. 
Right. And the, the origin of this event was in a toy factory in Guangdong, which is miles away, thousands of miles away from the homeland, where a, a villager uh, Uyghur youth taken to work in this toy factory headquartered in Los Angeles. Okay. And this toy factory uh, uh, it was a target for a local mob because there's a, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, people like to make us sexually objectionable comments about Uyghur women. Okay. Um, as reported in BBC, you know, that sure. story is not nice. new to us. We know that there's been always the uh, sexual violence aspect of uh, slow motion genocide has been brewing a long time ago. So that brawl, a uh, brawl with the local people and then the uh, toy factory workers uh, uh, really gotten to the point of um, resulting death in the uh, Uyghur uh, workers. And then the, the Uyghurs in the homeland said, okay, the government must do something about this. This is a gangster activity. There's a innocent people uh, trying to make a living. And these people are from the villages and they're not in a position to protect themselves. They barely speak the language. So the, the Uyghur youth in the Rimji took to the street carrying a Chinese flag, chanting pro-China uh, slogan, okay. saying nothing other than Adalet and Uyghur. Uh, justice and Uyghur, justice and Uyghur, Adalat right. and Uyghur, uh, justice. I'm sure that many Islamic uh, community yep. languages share that word. Uh, so, so chanting Adalat, uh, Uyghur type of protest uh, met with a heavy armed Chinese armed police. So they start uh, shooting, rounding up, and then the angry, the, the, the protesters ang get angry. It happens everywhere. Whenever the force is used, it turns to violence. So that in turn to a ethnic clash. Uh, the, um, it bothers me so much even to this day that Western media, uh, even some uh, governments, uh, some sympathetic people often say uh, 200 people died, uh, over 1,000 people injured, as if that, that information was credible. As if, and then they said, OK, it's more, uh, most of them are Han Chinese. That's exactly what the Chinese told the world. Melissa Chen, uh, the reporter um, from Al Jazeera, was on the ground uh, uh, July 7, to be exact, in 19, uh, 2009. She saw it, and she's been telling people that there are more casualties uh, that the government is not reporting. So that's the fact. And then what, 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 um, what has changed after that was that the Chinese government realized that um, they got to be uh, a final solution to the Xinjiang problem. They, there's a uh, there's a uh, slogan actually the papers academic papers, policy papers written. Uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, 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 senior advisor on China, uh, Miles Yu, uh, wrote something in a Hoover Institute online publication back in 2018, uh, making basically arguing that final solution to Xinjiang problem is something has been going on for a while. Uh, so it didn't just have a, a, a become an obvious. So that July 5, 2009 uh, did a couple of things. One, uh, they borrowed uh, some of the surveillance technology, start surveilling people. And then two, they armed uh, the traffic police even to use violence against people who are not compliant. There are videos online actually on YouTube that you can find that uh, people uh, chased out of the mosque and shoot in the middle of the street in the daylight by uh, police. And then there's also a report that a young man ran a uh, red light uh, riding motorcycle and shoot down uh, a killed by uh, a traffic police. Uh, then Australian um, uh, scholar David Brophy has written a book on this and similar topic. Um, and I, I spoke in an event with them in, in Sydney uh, in 2019, uh, 2018. And he said even some of the parking lot attendants were carrying gun. So they armed uh, people who are not supposed to have a gun uh, for a squelching Uyghur resentment. And then three, um, they uh, uh, brought in uh, uh, a military uh, to militarize, securitize the region. And then finally, uh, there's a policy shift as well, and which is we need to focus more on the stick, not on the carrot. Uh, so making people uh, rich during that period uh, from 1995 through 2009, 
some Uyghurs made fortune. There's Uyghur millionaires, uh, you know, doing border. Uyghurs are very, by nature, uh, Uyghurs are, are very good at doing business. Okay. So they, there's a right in the area that there was an active border trade that's taking place. Import ex business was booming between former Soviet republics and China. Uh, there are a lot of Uyghurs even importing stuff from the Middle East uh, or exporting to the Middle East. So the Chinese thought that, okay, this is not helping either. Those guys who went to uh, Central Asia, bringing back uh, some, you know, aspiration for independence, and those who are going to the Middle East, bringing back uh, the Islamic practices with them, uh, after, pilgrim, uh, after the pilgrimage, they realized that there's nothing uh, about God. Uh, so they worried that the Islam is actually awakening people. And then those who went to uh, Turkey becoming nationalists, thinking that when they walk around the museum, everything that they see is somewhat related to the Uyghurs inspired. So, yeah. so, they, so the, the, the people, and then those who were uh, able to send their kids to the West in North America, the uh, Western Europe uh, have been visiting these countries and having the taste of uh, uh, taste of democracy and the human rights and you know all the freedom. So the Chinese thought, okay, this is not working. Uh, this is uh, you know the the, uh, the the fear, the sense of insecurity was so obvious. And then starting 2012, after Xi Jinping took office, they 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 looking at different ways. And during that time, including these guys uh, who were uh, sanctioned under the Global Magnitsky Act last year were providing him some draconian measures to counter this growing threat. So that brings us to 2014 and he goes to Xi Jinping goes to Uyghur's homeland. And there's always already been a transitional uh, secretization in the process. And he goes to meet with the uh, Uyghur family, uh, just like most politicians do, kiss the baby. And then he was dumbfounded that the Uyghurs were wearing Uyghur clothes speaking uh, Uyghur language, not understanding, following much of the stuff that he was saying. He said, why these guys are still Uyghur? That was the response. Um, I, I, this has been written in, in, in a, um, written by some uh, uh, experts on the issue. And then uh, around that time when he was leaving the Urumqi's capital, the uh, region's capital, Urumqi, there was a bombing at the train station. Uh, fast forward, and from the 2015 all the way to 2016, uh, he was looking for a Chinese version of uh, Adolf Heichmann. He find that guy uh, in uh, Chen Chuenguo. Okay. Chen Chuenguo was a Tibetan uh, a, a party secretary in Tibet when that happened. Okay. So he got promoted. As you may recall, during that time, the self immolation was, was uh, on the rise. Uh, there are a lot of Tibetans took their own lives in frustration. Yeah. And this guy was ruling Tibet when that happened. And wow. then he got promoted. Um, and in August 2016, he was relocated to Urumqi from Lhasa and given all the tools that any politician, any, uh, any, anyone, any bureaucrat in China could ask for. Military, the budget, the technology, and then a seat in this powerful um, um, uh, entity called the Chinese Politburo, which is very tight-knit decision-making body. That actually, that is the entity, that is the body that runs uh, China technically. So he was given that seat. And then April, 2017, uh, his government uh, put in place something called um, de-extremification measure okay. that uh, literally criminalized uh, you objecting your daughter or son's marriage to someone who is not Muslim or who is oh. not Uyghur. As you see today, uh, forced marriage is one of the ways in which that the China is, is advancing, uh, uh, making it even more effective to them in the gen genocidal campaign. So this brings us to today. So it, it didn't just start it overnight. This has been proving uh, up uh, to uh, to the Chinese leadership, particularly Xi Jinping. That trip to the Uyghur's homeland was something uh, very uh, significant. Uh, he did not think very, that- 
uh, uh, just uh, piggybacking off what you just said here, um, you know, you had earlier mentioned, uh, Nuri, uh, about the Belt and Road initiative, uh, initiative, which is a staggering $1 trillion infrastructure project that uh, China is undertaking that some people are saying actually is the largest uh, infrastructure product in, in human history. Uh, and so ostensibly, because of this $1 trillion uh, Belt and Road initiative, uh, we've seen uh, prominent leaders of Muslim majority countries uh, like Turkey and Pakistan essentially whitewash China's crimes against humanity in the last couple of years. We saw uh, Pakistani Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan tell a Turkish news network that he didn't even really know what's going on uh, in Xinjiang, even though Pakistan shares a border there. And obviously, you had Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, who uh, said that uh, Uyghurs are living peacefully uh, in, in the region when his own foreign ministry had actually condemned China for their ethnic cleansing of Uyghurs. And so my next follow-up question is, what are some of your thoughts on Muslim world reaction uh, to the Uyghur genocide when it comes uh, to you know, these Muslim majority nations who are essentially being bought out uh, by uh, China's Belt and Road uh, $1 trillion initiative? Um, Ibtaha, that, that is something that bothers me so much. Um, it's not only immoral, I think it's un-Islamic. It is. Um, and, and, and I, you know, sometimes I just like to ask them, what do you tell your kids that you did or what you do um, during the day? Uh, I mean, this is that simple. Your Muslim brothers and sisters are suffering. Not only that you don't speak out, you either feign ignorance or pamper them. And so are, are, there, are there any, uh, do you see any uh, Muslim leaders today that are speaking out against the genocide? No, not, not to my knowledge. Uh, what has happened was in 2019, the United States um, uh, organized a religious freedom ministerial. Okay. There were uh, close to 40 countries signed a statement, signed on a statement condemning uh, the mass internment the terminology that they use then. Yeah. Uh, and there's only one country, Kosovo, was a signatory. And you know why they can sign that on that. Because, yeah, yeah for the history, they know- well, the Balkan genocide. Yeah. That, yeah, they know exactly how it ends. Uh, yeah. that, it is really a case for study, a good case for study. And also, um, uh, the, some countries, uh, the tide is turning. Um, recently, uh, there were a group of countries, I'm we're talking about not group, of, uh, I'm talking about substantial number of uh, countries signed on, it was 50 some countries now dropped to 39. Okay. Uh, not only agreed with China, but also think that there are being so wonderful to the uh, Uyghur Muslims. This includes Palestine, Pakistan, all of the stands in Central Asia, uh, yeah. Turkey did not signed on. Uh, I think it was Kuwait initially signed and then the withdrawal because of the criticism. Um, to this day, there's no single Muslim country uh, or influential Muslim leader, except for athletes like Mesut Uzil, uh, yeah. Sony Williams in, in New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, much of the, you know, like people like yourself, uh, the Muslim intellectuals have been speaking up. Uh, Mahdi Hassan uh, has done this, uh, Najid has done it, uh, Mustafa Kamal, uh, I'm sorry, Mustafa Aksu, uh, Mustafa Akyol, pardon. And so, so only this has been limited to journalists, uh, thought leaders, uh, academics, uh, students. So we have not seen a governmental action. But uh, when, when you ask me this question, um, I don't get annoyed uh, because we're both Muslim. Uh, yeah. And we believe that it's the moral obligation. But in a uh, Western democracy, or a people from non-Muslim country, uh, a, a developed country, uh, representative asked me that question, I get annoyed. And my response is like, how about you? Yeah, and and, and you know, Nuri, uh, you know, and, and for both of us, you know, as Muslim human rights lawyers, obviously, I mean, I can tell you that it, it annoys me, uh, you know, that Pakistan and Turkey and other leaders are essentially whitewashing the genocide for a few you know, dollars for infrastructure projects. The last two questions that I have for you, I, again, I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna package them together and, and again, let you finish um, how you'd like. Uh, in July, 2019, uh, 34 Republican and Democratic senators uh, co-sponsored S-178, uh, which is known as the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. 
uh, which was finally signed into law uh, by Donald Trump before he left office. Can you tell us a little bit of the significance of this piece of legislation? Do you think it's symbolic? And what kind of impact could it have on economic sanctions to the Chinese government? And my last question to you when packaged together is one day before leaving office, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Secretary, former Secretary of State, now uh, Mike Pompeo declared a genocide uh, going against the Uyghur people. So looking forward, uh, you know, what sort of significance do you think that has? And more importantly, what kind of expectations do you now have for the Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris administration when it comes to uh, the Uy uh, Uyghur genocidal crisis? Those are excellent questions. Um, that brings us uh, to the point that what do we do about this? Uh, right. We should talk more about what do we do about it than what has happened. I mean, the evidence is mounting, uh, overwhelming. Uh, and, and now with the genocide determination, everyone should be considering various options to stop this genocide. The genocide uh, determination uh, oftentimes uh, forgot uh, the future um, aspect. For example, the gen genocide prevention. When you look at um, the last 10 years, uh, since 2010-11, uh, the international community have experienced three genocidal campaigns. The first against Yazidis and then the Rohingya Muslims and now us. The sole reason is that the, uh, the international community has failed to respond. So using this, I mean, in the backdrop of this uh, concern and advocacy, the United States Congress uh, uh, introduced a, the bill that you're uh, referencing, which was the first time in the Uyghur's human history that a Western government or any government uh, other than China legislated anything that is in the interest of the Uyghur people. Mm. Uh, a historic uh, substantive nature cannot be understated. So, uh, and, 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 and in, in, in order to lobby and, and put in place a legislative mandate like that requires a lot of lobbying effort, even sometimes requires a lot of money. Yep. And there will be a lot of uh, a cat fight, but the, the beautiful aspect of this bill was that it was overwhelmingly supported. Every single senator, unanimous consent. Yeah. And over 400 uh, members of Congress supported it. And what this bill does um, is exactly what has been happening. Uh, a, uh, the, the, one of the most important aspects to me goes to the, uh, it goes to, I mean, it's somewhat related to your first question about my first late life. I'm not feeling free in this country because of the China's uh, uh, threat, uh, 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 harassment and threat against my uh, fellow Uyghurs, some of them not US citizen, so that they feel that they're not being protected, uh, not feeling safe in this country. So that uh, the Uyghur bill does exactly that. Uh, it has a, a law enforcement aspect that requires the FBI to protect the Uyghurs. And also one of the most important uh, provisions, uh, the, the enforcement of Global Magnitsky Act right. has happened. Uh, as you may recall, after the enactment of law, uh, the, uh, the previous administration announced two Magnitsky sanction announcement, the one was against four Chinese officials. One of them is the guy that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, he's the actual ruler uh, of the uh, Uyghur region today. Okay. And then the second is also somewhat related to today's conversation that everyone is, uh, is rightfully focusing, forced labor. That very entity that um, uh, sanctioned uh, was Xinjiang Production Construction Corp, XPCC is the acronym. Uh, under this legislative mandate, the administration was compelled to go after this entity with over 800,000 shell companies around the world. Wow. So the, the consumer products that, been report, that have been reported uh, being made by uh, Uyghur slaves, the modern slaves, connected to this entity. So the, the implementation is in the work. If you ask me, I can tell you with a straight face that it's not a substantive uh, uh, law. Sure. That does not cover everything, but if you ask me on a personal level uh, and the things that I have been advocating, yes, it is significant. And, and I, I'm very grateful that that law adopted some of the uh, uh, key recommendations that I made publicly, privately, and through my congressional testimonies. The most important thing is happening uh, since January 19. Okay. Uh, 
for what's worth, uh, this is a, 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 another case for study uh, because as lawyer, you know that oftentimes uh, when uh, atrocities determination is made, um, mm -hmm. one of the key aspect um, is uh, if there's a mass uh, killing is, yes. has happened or is happening. And then two, um, the, uh, is there any genocidal intent? So it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to ascertain or prove that intent because we're dealing with one of the most secretive governments around the world to this day does not allow journalists, independent human rights NGOs to investigate. So we will not, we will not be able to prove through a documentation that they have a genocidal intent, but their practice preventing 25% uh, population growth in 2019, 2018, uh, and, and looking at 80 some percent uh, decline in the Uyghur population growth in previous five years based on their own st statistics. And then there's a sexual violence against the Uyghur woman. So as you, as you know, two key uh, legal uh, requirements for genocide involves woman population control and then the other one is a separation forced separation of Uyghur, uh, children from the group and and transferring them to another that's exactly what is happening and if you add the other aspect you can you can make a case but the united states government uh heavily focused i was not in the uh, in the room when the final decision was made but uh, the user that I'm serving as a commissioner uh, since my appointment, uh, taking this position early on, uh, we sounded the alarm that uh, the secretary might need to look at this carefully. As you know, uh, State Department only made similar decision five times since the United States uh, ratified the Geneva Convention in 1988. And State Department lawyers are in not, not in favor of making this kind of decision because if, you, if the, the action does not follow, it becomes meaningless. Right. And if it's politicized too much, then in the future, this, this tool cannot be applied. So there's a, a very, um, like a whole of government approach uh, under the whole government approach, lawyers from various departments, the, the justice, the FBI, the state looked at this and, 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 and it was something that they cannot say that we can ignore. And, um, and Pompeo made an announcement. I think we should move on because Blinken, even, even when he became a secretary of state, publicly acknowledged um, uh, saying that that would be my judgment in his uh, confirmation hearing. And he's been saying, I mean, this government has been talking about this almost daily. Uh, in his first call to Chinese uh, top diplomat, uh, Secretary Blinken specifically said that there will be ramification. There, uh, the U.S. government will hold those to account for abusing international system. And uh, you can interpret the way that you want international system. Yes, uh, what does genocide uh, convention uh, falls under? International system. Uh, so we were, were I, I am uh, 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 cautiously optimistic about uh, the the steps that the United States government under the Biden administration will take, at least continuity is, some, is something that I am uh, confident that, we'll, uh, we'll, we, that we will see. Uh, there are 50, uh, more than 50 Chinese entities been added to the um, Commerce Department's entity list. There have been a visa ban against the Chinese officials uh, there's another legislation is currently being considered to address the modern day slavery. Uh, sec uh, President Biden said back in August 2020 that uh, what is happening is a genocide. Uh, and, 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 and his campaign release statement uh, two weeks later said the same thing. So I think uh, the issue is in a good, good place. But the challenge, um, uh, the next step is how seriously that our allies and partners will take this. Uh, they have no excuse. In the past, they said, oh, it's all about Trump. Trump is gone. Yeah, yeah uh, we have a president that you have a history of working with. And we have a president who has been preparing for this job uh, last five decades. And this is the person who understand uh, what it means to build alliance. So uh, I, I am, I'm hopeful that the Europeans, uh, particularly those countries that 
survive Nazi Germany, fascism, uh, should be able to join the force. I am uh, happy actually seeing uh, the tra uh, trajectory or trend line in UK. The UK Parliament is actually actively uh, considering to amend the uh, trade bill to add uh, a genocide provision to it. So um, I'm just uh, uh, eager to hear from uh, Emmanuel Macron, Angela mm -hmm. Merkel, uh, uh, hopefully someday from Erdogan. Well, Nuri, uh, I want to um... I want to thank you. Um, you know, as, as again, as a Muslim human rights lawyer myself, um, I understand uh, the, uh, the the amount of work uh, that it takes to even get any recognition for the plight of, of, of Muslim human rights uh, in in the world today. And and obviously, when you're dealing with the 800 pound gorilla of, of China and then the government of Xi Jinping and their one trillion dollar uh, you know, pocketbook. Uh, I, it can't be easy. Uh, it is yeoman's work that, that you have done. And, and I personally, uh, I want to thank you for giving a voice uh, to the, the voiceless. And, and, and I hope that, um, you know, the next four years uh, under President Biden uh, will be better for uh, not only the Uyghur people, but for uh, persecuted minorities all over the world. So on behalf of the Muslim Voices podcast at Indiana University, I want to thank you uh, for your time today. Uh, if uh, your uh, if our viewers would like to follow you, I know they can follow you at Nuri Turkel uh, on Twitter, but if you have a website or anything else in terms of where people can keep uh, up to date with not only what you're doing, but obviously the plight of the Uyghurs, uh, you know, we, we'd love for you to share that as well. Yes, thank you so much. It's very kind of you. Um, I personally have been following your work with admiration. Um, I, I, it's a privilege to have this conversation with you and I cannot be more grateful to your team for having uh, or giving me this opportunity to uh, tell the Uyghur story. Um, uh, I co-founded a, um, a research organization called the Uyghur Human Rights Project in 2003. I'm currently serving the organization's uh, board chair. We have a website, uhrp.org. Okay. There are a wealth of information. Uh, we have progr uh, programmatic reports. Uh, on, on various issues. Uh, we have published nearly 80 uh, reports uh, since its funding. Uh, we have a professional team uh, working day in, day out on these issues. And also um, there's a link on the website. Uh, those of you who may want to support this organization financially, there's a donation link. There's also a link for you to find out uh, things that you can do. Uh, what can you do to help link? So, this website should be your best friend to get information, get updated, and uh, uh, offer help. Uh, we are looking for uh, uh, talent uh, to support uh, social media campaign, uh, strategic communication, fundraising, public advocacy. Uh, if you have a free time, if you wanted to help, this is where this is where you should uh, consider going to help. And then I, I encourage everyone uh, to uh, not only follow Nuri Turkel uh, on social media, but also visit the website again, in terms of you know, our ability to be able to be uh, agents of change within our spheres of influence. So again, on behalf of uh, the Muslim Voices podcast at Indiana University, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. I'd like to thank my guest, uh, the esteemed uh, attorney, uh, Nuri Turkel for his time. And uh, we will see you uh, on our next episode very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.